Amen, amen. Okay, so we're jumping right into uh, the You Asked For It series. We are in week four, actually, and um, I'm trying to get my notes to cooperate. Uh, We are in week four, and we've got a brand new question for you, and here's the question right on your screens. How do I know I'm hearing God versus just a gut feeling? How do I know it's not the burrito I ate an hour ago, right? Like, like sometimes I have a feeling, but it's not the right kind of feeling. How do I know God from that? How do I know I'm hearing God versus my own selfish desires? Now, this question was asked like five times. I've just kind of summarized them into this list um, because sometimes I can walk around and say, I heard God say, do a thing, but you know, uh, that's just what you wanted all along, true blood. We know you, Right. Like sometimes it goes that way. Or how do I know I'm hearing God versus the enemy deceiving me? And and by the enemy, I mean the enemy of our souls, Satan himself, who is a real person. He's not a legend. He's not a cartoon. Uh, There is a, a supernatural being, Satan, that absolutely does speak into and influence our lives. And we've got to know the difference. Amen. We have to know the difference. And I'm going to show you this from the scripture as we go through the rest of this. But um, there's just a couple things today uh, in this message that I want to make really clear to you um, before we hit God's word. Um, The very first thing is that these questions, (coughs) they're not just theological. Um, For many of us, there's a real pain in the center of our experience with Jesus Christ. Um, And sometimes that pain is that I feel like I am on my own completely and that God isn't actually there. And the reason I don't hear God is because God isn't actually there. And we're doing church, but what we're doing is we're playing church and we're pretending. I've talked about this a few weeks ago. But that right there, that little lie is extremely painful if you're trying to follow God today. And what I'm going to do is replace that lie with God's healing that God wants to speak with you. And I believe if you seek after him today and you open your ears to what his word has to say, you can start hearing God speak to you. And when he does, you're gonna begin an actual friendship with Jesus. That friendship's gonna be real. That friendship is going to build your faith. It's gonna change your whole life. There's also a lie that says that God doesn't speak to people these days. And so there are some Christians that claim to have heard a thing from God. They made those things up and then they believed them really hard. Everybody gets really quiet when you say that. Um, It's hard to say some of the lies out loud. It bothers us, but we got to say it out loud before we can get to the truth. Amen. Because that's wrong. Faith is not a lie. Faith is not made up. And faith is not what naive Christians do. When we say that God speaks to us, God speaks and we believe that. And when God speaks to us, not only do we believe it, so we do bring faith to the the equation, but we also test it. We also test it. Why? Because we've got the courage to test it. Because if I'm going to believe God spoke to me, I want the real stuff. I don't want anything manufactured at all. So I'm willing to test it and I believe God can handle it. Amen? God can handle it. Um, Okay, before we jump in, um, one more thing is that there are a lot of verses today. If you're a note taker, please take notes. Um, My common pattern for a message is I like to point you to one big passage of scripture and then we just spend time in that one with maybe a few other verses, but there's one main passage of scripture. Because of the nature of the questions that you guys asked today, what I want to do is I want to give you um, kind of an overview of the New Testament understanding of how to hear God. And a lot of that understanding doesn't just come from one passage. It comes from a lot of different passages where we see different saints of God in the first century, try to hear his voice and we're going to observe how he did it. So again, if you're a note taker, giddy up. We're about to get going here. Um, hearing God isn't easy. Yes, it's not easy. Um, God doesn't just put his will for your life up on a billboard. He likely doesn't walk into your room when you're having a quiet time face to face and just tell you what he means. And this kind of messes with us. 
Like, why is it hard to hear God? Why is it, why does it feel like I've got to seek him and I've got to wait and I've got to try and I've, I've got to, all of these things in order to hear the voice of God and it messes with us and it stirs our doubts just a little bit. There is a seeking that God requires of us. Why is that? Uh, Proverbs 25, two, I believe says it. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of Kings is to search things out. Did you know that the New Testament says that in Christ you are royalty today? You are kings and queens of the kingdom, right? There is a certain grown-up, privileged nature to what it's describing here. And it says that God could just absolutely be blunt, and there it is. But there's something in his nature he wants to conceal so that you unconceal it. Like, that's what the verse says, right? He conceals it so that you will unconceal it. Why? Because there's something in the process that draws you closer to him in friendship. It's the waiting. It's the questioning. It's the coming near. It's the getting so frustrated. You finally shut everything else down and you finally just go to him completely. And you say, God, I will do whatever it takes to hear the clarity of your voice on this matter and to understand you that when you come to that place of surrender, you're finally ready to hear. It's weird. It's, we want God to just be blunt about it. We just want him to slap his big old God foot down in front of us and say, here it is. But do you know what would happen if he did that? He would coerce you to his will. And he does not want to do that. What do you mean coerce me? Well, if God just told you his will for your life every single moment of every single day and he made it absolutely plain, do you know what you would do? You would do it. You would do what he says. But you wouldn't do what he says because you love him. You would do it out of fear. Because what else am I gonna do? God's right here. So I'll, yeah, I'll do it. It's not what he wants. He wants children that come to him and they want his word. They welcome his word. They're not afraid of his word. Do you see what the father has in mind here? Come near, come near and show me that your heart is to seek me. The scripture says, you will seek me and find me when you seek after me with all of your heart. God messes with us, right? There's a, I've told this story before, I'll tell it again, but there was a time I was in uh, kids ministry and the best Sunday school teacher who ever lived, Debbie Austin, was there. And we were in this elementary room and there was a, a, a stage kind of like this. And she just got down and she sat on the edge of that stage and the kids, all the elementary kids in the room were all being chaotic and loud. And, and, and what you expected was somebody to come and just shout louder than the kids and, and command them to attention. And it's not what she did. Instead, she sat down and she just started speaking to the kids and she just started speaking normal volume. And if they were yelling, they couldn't hear her. And that was all by design. Now there was a foundation for this. They all knew Debbie Austin was the best Sunday school teacher ever. And that when she spoke, they were good things that she was speaking. So all of a sudden when she's sitting there and they can just barely hear that she's saying something and I can't hear what she's saying, they all start to one by one go themselves quiet and walk closer toward her. And all of a sudden they're all sitting around her. She never even asked them to. It's amazing. Jedi move, right? Is it possible that God does the same process with all of us? That he says, my word is right here, but you're going to have to surrender. You're going to have to want. You're going to have to welcome. And then you can hear. Is the glory of God to conceal things and the glory of kings to search them out. Christians can hear Jesus' voice. John 10, verse 25 um, Oh, we've got it. Excellent. We didn't have it first service. Someone real quickly made that for second service. Thank God. Amen. Technology people are so good. Um, John 10, 25, you need to hear this one. Uh, Christians hear Jesus' voice. This might be the most important scripture of the entire message this morning. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. He's speaking to people who are against him here, by the way. He says, the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you were not among my sheep. So it's about, are you among my sheep? Are you a child of God? Are you a Christian or are you not? 
So you're, you, you either are or you're not. And then he says, verse 27, my sheep, if you're my sheep, you'll hear my voice. And I know those sheep and those sheep follow me. So if you're a sheep of God today, you have the ability to hear his voice. It's a superpower given to you at salvation. People say to me all the time, hey, pastor, I'm like really good with the Bible and I love the church, but this whole like God speaking to me thing, like that doesn't happen for me. I'm just one of those Christians that never hears God speak. I don't think that's true. I just don't think that's true. Jesus said, you have the power. And he says also, my sheep hear my voice because I know them and so that they will follow me. He wants you following him more closely in relationship and you need to hear his voice in order for that to happen. Um, Romans eight fourteen. If you're a child of God, you're led by the spirit. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Do you notice the period at the end of that sentence? It's a powerful period. If you're led by the spirit of God, you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, you're led by the spirit of God. You have the ability to be led by God. That's not just Bible reading there. Like I'm being led by God day in and day out. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his children. Now we call him Abba Father for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You see there, the, verse 16, just absolutely blew me away this week. His spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, part of the Trinity has come somehow infused with your spirit. And as he's fused with your spirit, what is he telling you? He's telling you you're God's child. Amen. Why? Because we doubt it every day. We're unsure every day. Am I saved? Am I still saved? Have I done enough to make him mad? Come on. This is us. And the Holy Spirit has to come to us. And he's not just being a compass, even though that's part of what he does, right? Like sometimes people are like, I want God to speak. So he tells me the right decisions to make. Be the compass of my life. Tell me right or left. That's what I want God to do. And that's part of what he does. Compassing is part of the thing. But he's not just a compass. Here, what he's telling you is that you're secure. That you're loved. That you're his child. You can call him father. That's what the spirit is saying to you even now. So good. Next verse, Galatians 5. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit always wants. And the spirit gives you desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Like inside of you, there's a battle. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions because your flesh is still there. But when you're directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. He's saying it's not about knowing all of the rules. It's about following the spirit because the spirit will always lead you right. Are you being led? You have to let him guide you. Amen. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful natures to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the spirit, let us follow the spirit's leading in every part of our lives. That whole passage there in Galatians 5, if you're someone who wants to study this more deeply, just open up Galatians 5. The whole passage is a very long treatment of this whole idea. It's all the words that he says. You got to let the spirit guide you. You got to be directed by the spirit. And then you got to follow the spirit's leading. And you've even got to live by the spirit. That spot where it says, follow the spirit's leading in every part of your lives. That's translated better in the ESV. And it says, keep in step with the spirit. It's like a dance. The spirit's dancing. And you ought to be watching his feet. Yes? Like we're confused. What he's saying is, it's not about you just knowing the Bible and following the Bible, even though that's huge. 
There's also this whole other area of the Christian life where you're being drawn, just like Debbie Austin and the kids, you're being drawn into relationship with God to hear his voice for today. And, and you should want it. You should, you should desire it. You should go, go as far as to silence the rest of the world so that you can hear it. And then when you hear it, you get in step with him and you follow him. And now you're dancing. Let's look at Peter. Because sometimes we hear wrong. Let's talk about hearing wrong for a second. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Some of you guys know this story. I love Peter, the apostle Peter. He's just so funny to like laugh at when he fails, right? Um, but, 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 but really what, what happens is he's such a humble guy and we get, to, um, we get to learn from him. Verse 15, then Jesus asked the 12 disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. So here's an example of being led by God. Very, very specific words. Jesus looks at Peter and says, you didn't get this from the Bible. He says, you didn't get this from your human logic. It didn't come from anything human at all. This knowledge that you have that I'm the Messiah, it was downloaded to your brain by God the Father. And that's why you're saying it right now. That's an amazing moment that Peter just had. But wait, there's more. Verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that he would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. So he's just telling them what we all know, but they didn't know it at the time, and they didn't like the idea that Jesus was going to die. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand Jesus, which is always a bad idea. Don't reprimand God. <sighs> he began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. It's amazing to me that in the same scene, in the same conversation, Peter hears God perfectly. And then he hears Satan perfectly. Ever been there? I mean, that's the nature of the question that we got today, right? How do I know the difference? Because sometimes I'm hearing all the voices and there's so much honesty in that. Thank you for those questions, by the way. There's so much honesty in that because Peter struggled with the same thing. Here's what's beautiful about Peter's situation. Jesus was there and Jesus sorted it out. So Peter was being human, guys. Like he let both voices through. I get it. Jesus said yes to this and no to this. And Peter had to take that. That is a good moment. Amen. We need Jesus to be near and to help us test things. First John 4, 1 says the same thing. God does not want you to be a gullible Christian. Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test it. This is just one spot of many in the New Testament where it talks about the fact that someone might say that they've got a word from God and you need to test it. There are times when the apostles got what they believed was a leading from God and it turned out to be wrong. Did you know the, the apostles made mistakes? Even in the New Testament, absolutely they did. And it's their humility to repent that we admire so much, not their perfection in getting everything right all the time. We need to know that. Um, we should welcome tests. Tests are what help us know that something's real. Testing the word of God does not make us low faith. Okay. So I've got a knife here. A knife in a sheath. I know. Am I to be trusted? <clears throat> this knife, when I was a kid, was shown to me. Um, and I was told that my grandfather fought in World War II. He was in the European theater. And that he had taken this off of a Nazi soldier. And so when he passed away several years back, this knife was given to me. 
And here's the thing, if we're really honest, like there are a lot of legends in your family, right? There are a lot of stories that you've been told. And some of those stories you're like, I don't know if that one's true. Right? Like, like that sounds really, really good. But was that embellished somewhere along the way? How do I really know for sure? Right? And so after he died, um, I went and I researched this knife um, because I wanted to know. Hobby Lobby, absolutely. So I took that picture last night at my kitchen table. Um, you can see there's some markings right there at the hilt of that knife. And then I kind of zoomed in in the next picture over there and ran kind of a, a contrast filter on it. And you, you can see um, what's going on there. And, and what it says across the top of that lion insignia is C. Gustav Spitzer, which is a manufacturer in Germany at the time that the Nazis were doing their thing. And then Solingen is the actual name of the city that was well known for producing knives for policemen and soldiers at that time. And, and they could actually look at the way that the, the handle is shaped and several other markings. And they could tell me the exact kind of Nazi soldier that carried that knife and went. I tested it. I took, a, I took the legend and I tested it and the markings proved I was able to find this, this uh, antique history dealer online, had pictures of my knife along with some parts that got missing somewhere along the line, by the way, probably because they let me play with it when I was a kid or something like that, you know, who knows. You got to test things, yes? So someone says, I got a word from God. Have you tested it? Are you sure? Because that's not a bad thing to say. Are you sure? And there's, there's some very clear ways in the scripture that the scripture teaches. Whenever you hear something from God, you can test it to know whether or not it's true. So four essential tests, the very first one, scripture. And you guys saw that one coming. Scripture is the first test. Now look closely at what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. This is a massive verse for you. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So part of what scripture is supposed to do is it's supposed to filter the good from the bad. And it's supposed to filter the good from the bad, not only your priorities and your behavior and your beliefs and all that kind of stuff. It's supposed to come in and help you understand whether or not you really heard from God. Because you might say yes, but the Bible says no. And if ever you're in the situation like that, the Bible wins. Amen. The Bible wins every single time. Scripture. We believe scripture there are people that will come and they will say certain things. And as soon as the words are out of their mouth, I know they're wrong. Um, I knew a man who was attending a church service and he was attending it with his girlfriend. And the problem was, is that in the early service that morning, his wife was still coming. And when I met with the man and his girlfriend and I said, why is this happening? What he said is, God knows that we're not married in our hearts, he and his previous wife. He knows that she violated my vows and that this is all okay. And because I know the scripture, I got to say, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. God will not speak to you differently than he has spoken to us in his word. There is no verse that says, if the person that you're married to stops keeping their vows, then you get to divorce them. That verse isn't in there. In fact, Jesus is really clear. It's like, it takes infidelity. There's a, there's a part where Paul says in the, uh, later on in the New Testament, it's one of the Corinthians. He says, if they've abandoned you, then you could divorce. There's, there's, there's very specific, but it's not just, you know, I don't like them anymore. Scripture wins. The next test for anything that you believe you've heard from God is God's character. So James 3 has a great passage about this. Um, he says, if you are wise and understand God's way, verse 13, prove it 
by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Do you see that phrase? Humility that comes from wisdom. What he's saying is, hey, if you've got actually God's wisdom, then things will come from it. Like fruit and, and, and results will come from it. Some of you guys have heard somebody say, I heard from God and I'm doing this thing. And then you watch this destruction come out of the wake of that decision. And that wasn't the fruit that he's talking about here. The fruit should be the fruit of God's character. The fruit of the spirit is what you should see as a result of a decision that was made motivated by God. It's a test. Jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. But the wisdom from above, verse 17, is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving. It is gentle at all times. I mean, dive deep into this passage. It's willing to yield to others. It's not egotistical and all on its own. It's submitted, right? It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Some of us believed we got a word from God and it was not. And then we blamed God for what happened. Don't do that. Test it against God's character. God will never give you a leading that is contrary to his character. And if you follow his leading, the fruit of the spirit should result absolutely. Um, before I married Linda, I was praying about whether or not I should marry Linda. She did tell me yes. I hadn't asked yet, actually. But it's, it's one of the most important decisions of your entire life. You should take that to God. You should ask. And I was praying and, and I took a bunch of time and I was like all stuck in my head about whether or not I should propose and all this kind of stuff. And, and um, here's what I wanted, okay? I just wanted a yes or no from God. Like I was praying, I was paying my dues. I wanted the yes or no from God. Like be my compass, God. Again, there's goods to all of that, but God won't always just give you the simple yes or no. What God did for me is he came in and he said, you know, there's a spirit about you right now, Josh, in this whole thing. And what you're, what you're really asking me to do is to protect you from making any kind of mistake that would lead to pain for you in marriage. You're asking me for a no pain guarantee. And God does not give you a no pain guarantee in marriage. Where are the married people at? You should have said a louder amen, Right? <laughs> He doesn't give you a no pain guarantee. He said, maybe your heart as you come to me should be that you're willing to care for her no matter what happens. Because that's what I do with my bride. I care for her no matter what happens. God's word to me was not the yes or no. He told me what the better question was that I should have asked. See, I was out of line with the character of God. Do you see that? And he had to bring me back in line with his character. That's the second test. Third test is God's people. Proverbs eleven fourteen: without wise leadership, a nation falls, but there is safety in having many advisors, many advisors. There's such a humility to saying, hey, test me. There's such a humility to like, I, I feel pretty strongly that God's leading me this direction, but I'm going to go to these other people that God has put in my life and I'm going to ask them what their wisdom is. What do you think? Oh my goodness, right? Like you've really got to get out of your own ego to do that, especially if you're really getting out of your own ego to do it for real. Like I really want to hear the truth no matter where this thing leads. Would you come and tell me? Now that's your pastors, that's your, that's your life group, people that know you in your life group, you're going to them, people that you've built trust. If you're married today, the primary advisor is your spouse. God gave them to you, seek their wisdom. You're like, well, they don't have wisdom in this area. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend you didn't say that. <laughs> Here's the thing. There are times 
that God makes me wise in certain areas beyond my years because I'm a pastor and the reputation of Jesus is too important sometimes for him to leave me to me. So he will supernaturally give me bits of wisdom when I am in my authority and in my office, he will give me those things. I don't mean it's, it's this way every single time. I don't mean it like that. But I'm saying when someone married you, God gave them authority in your family to speak. You need to respect that. If you're, if you're under 18 and you're living at home, your parents are your primary authority. Listen to them. You're like, my parents don't understand me. I get it. I get it. But when you, when you invite in the counsel and the advice of those people that God has given authority in your life, what you're really doing is yielding to God, not to them. And there'll be a protection in your life for that. Also, <clears throat> Be careful how you pick your other counselors. I've seen it numerous times. There's times that we have a leading, we, we, we have a place that we want to go, and we're pretty sure, and then we go and we choose counselors that we already know agree with us. <laughs> you stack the deck. Don't stack the deck with advisors, okay. right? Amen. Yeah, you'll get just what you were after. Um. And then you've got an unfolding life. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 13. Um, Paul says, the only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Please forgive me for this wrong. Now, <clears throat> it's almost unfair that I'm giving you that verse, but that's one that you've really got to study. You've got to study the context of it. But let me just tell you just quickly um, the picture there is that Paul was a church planter and most of the churches that he went and he planted, he would ask the, the people there that came to Christ and became part of that church, he would ask them to support him financially. Right, so so I did multiple things that that got that got him where he needed to go as a as a missionary. Right, he got him fully supported. Plus, he didn't have to work a lot of jobs in order to, um, uh, which would have taken all of his available time. He was able to be that pastor for them because his needs were taken care of. But also, what else did it do? It caused those people to grow up a little bit. Because now they're taking part in the gospel and the gospel going forward to more and more people and more and more churches. They're financially supporting that. And that was good for them. And he gets here to 2 Corinthians and he says, when I came to Corinth, I planted this church and he didn't ask them for any money. And he was so convinced that that group of people really needed him to give them the gospel 100% free. And he was afraid that if he asked them for any financial support into his life, they would get confused. They would think he was being selfish and they wouldn't accept the gospel of Jesus. But by the time he gets to 2 Corinthians writing, we think it's his third or fourth letter to them. By the time he gets to that space, he can now realize, I kept you as spiritual children by doing that. I should have asked you to take part in this. I shouldn't have made this free. I know I'm opening a lot of different cans of worms there. But what he says is, I had a leading in the beginning and I thought it was right. And once I saw it actually pan out in life, I can see now that it was wrong. Do you see the apostle saying that? The apostles sometimes got things wrong. That's a massive thing for us to know. There, there are some times that you're just going to be hearing God and you're just going to believe God, okay? And that's what you need to do, by the way. You just need to believe God and let those words come. And then you need to begin testing them. And some of those things you're going to test and you're going to see in life, it just doesn't pan out and that's okay. Don't freak out. Try the next one, right? And try to hear God more. And as you start to get to hear God more, you'll see which ones actually do conform to his word and his character, which one uh, other believers are in agreement with and they pan out in life and you're like, I got that one right. I got all these other ones wrong, but I got this one right. And don't sweat it. That's just part of the process. As you believe God and as you hear his voice and as you step forward in hearing his voice, you're gonna learn more and more about how the voice of God sounds like. And I don't mean audibly, 
I mean the way that he speaks and the way that he speaks to you. It's a process and you grow in it. It's almost like learning the language that he speaks so that the next time you hear him more clearly. Almost like that. I knew a guy, wonderful guy, big faith in God. And he believed this woman over here was supposed to be his wife. And he told her so. God said, we're going to get married. And they were not dating at the time. Tough. Tough. And he was so convinced and people would tell him, hold on a second, man. Are you sure? Are you sure? But he just, he felt like faith was just holding on to that thing and not letting go. And then when she married another man, it crushed him. And he finally grew through that and was able to get through that. But guys, life just did not prove out that that's what God had said to him. And he needed to let go of the thing. And sometimes it's our ego is wrapped up in it. Sometimes bad theology is wrapped up in this. Just let go, okay? Just let go. All right. I'm going to finish with this. Use those four tests. Act in faith. Be risky, but then test it. And let the voice of God come into your life. Why does the voice of God want to come into your life? Because he's drawing you into closer friendship with him. Amen? Amen. Be part of that process. Let that process happen. Like you want that, seek that. Seek the voice of God in your life. It's everything. So I'm going to take a right turn here. Um, hopefully this makes sense. We'll see. But the book of Revelation, I told you it was the right turn. The book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John is there. And if you know the story of John, um, he was the person who wrote the book of John, the gospel of John. And, and he was the disciple that Jesus loved. And he just keeps using these phrases to give you an idea of just how tight they were, how close they were in friendship. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being so close in friendship with Jesus that you know the sound of his laugh, that you know his mannerisms, that you know what he's going to say and do, maybe even before he says it? That's just how tight you are. That, 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 that Jesus and who Jesus is is in stuff that you read in a book somewhere and tried to memorize like you know him. And that's how John was. And it's just not, it's not just like knowing anybody, right? It's like you've known people and like maybe you've even lost people, but knowing people and losing people, it's like they're just people. And some of those people were complex and some of them weren't nice to you. And, but man, the people that you can remember that you've lost that were just so kind and so loving to you, don't you miss them the most? Don't you have the bond with them that, it's hard to be apart. And I talk to some of you guys all the time and you just got a longing and you got a missing inside of you because you've lost that person. And so <laughs> apply that to Jesus. He's the kindest person who ever lived. Can you imagine being a friend with Jesus? And then could you imagine him ascending into heaven and you don't get to see him face to face anymore? Hard, it had to be so hard. So anyway, Revelation chapter one. This happens at the end of John's life and the early church fathers tell us that John was probably in his late 70s or early 80s when he wrote the book of Revelation, which is just, it's ancient in Bible times to be that old. And he was exiled to this little island called Patmos and, and he's literally walking along in Patmos and he says it's on the Lord's day, so it's on a Sunday and bam, there's Jesus and he sees him face to face again. And he knows who he's looking at, guys. But it's been like 50 years since he's seen him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the longing and the missing that he went through and all of a sudden there he is. You know, the Bible says we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Someday you will be face to face with the greatest friend you ever had. Do you know him? He wants you to know him. Do you feel a longing about that? 
I was reading about John and that moment that he had, which what's weird is I feel like I could say I miss him today. This is the weird part. You're like, but you've not seen. I know. I just feel like I miss him. I feel like I long for him. I feel like I want to be close to him. I feel like I want to know him more and more. And I feel like I want to be in his presence more and more. And I feel like I want to, I want to walk right beside him in step with him because I want the friendship to just... And when I, when I walk away from the friendship, guys, and, and I know the friendship that we used to have, do you know how much I miss it? And I want to get back to it. And do you feel that today? Because, you know, we, we got the questions in there about like, well, how, how do we tell the difference between this voice and that voice? And that's good. But it's like, do you want to hear his voice? Because the reason you should want to hear his voice is because you want to walk with him as a friend. And I just admit, for some of us, like talking like that feels like, oh boy, here we go, a mystical and, and emotional kind of language about Jesus. And it's hard to understand. And we say it's a relationship and not a religion. And, and some of us just haven't entered into that yet before. And I just say you're missing out. Um, I'm not talking about something that doesn't exist. It, it's, it's the center of my life. And you need it. It's when everything changes. Why don't you guys stand? I'm trying to stir you because some of you have never heard God speak. And what I would tell you today is John did not have a relationship with a book. And John did not have a friendship with a religion. He knew a person. And I want you to have a, a friendship with a person. And this whole, like, God, I need you to speak to me. Like, we're going to pray here in just a second that God would speak to you. And I don't know what you need to hear. But do you long for it? Are you willing to shut everything else out? Let's pray. And as we pray, you might even just want to put a hand up to God right now like you're reaching toward him and just, just God, we want you. God, we want your voice to speak to us for real. And God, we're not going to be gullible. God, we're going to test it. God, we, we want the real thing. We, we don't want any fakes, but God, would you speak, God? Show us, show us that you're coming near. And God, for those who have never heard you speak, God, or, or they've never quieted long enough to listen, or they didn't believe that you would or that you could, God. I pray that you would speak so loud toward them. God, speak right to their heart what it is that they need. Holy Spirit, you're big enough and you're strong enough, God. Would you do it, Lord? All across this room, online right now, God, would, would you speak, God? I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ that you would speak. And God, we want to hear. And God, for those in the room, God, that, that have heard you speak in the past, but it's been a long time. And God, they've started to question what happened in the past, Lord. They've started to question whether or not their sin has separated them from you. God, would you just come near to them, God? Would you renew the friendship, God? Jesus, we want to hear your voice. God, we love you. In Christ's name, amen.